Cricketers started to earn real money, both in the form of national contracts and endorsement deals. For the first time, cricketers won billboards and television advertising products, advertising anything from sausages to cellular networks. Cricket became a viable profession, and cricketers were both icons and role models. Personally, the win was very important for me. Until that time, I was playing cricket with no real passion or ambition. I never thought or dreamed of playing for my country. This changed when I watched Sri Lanka play Kenya at Asgiria. It was my final year in school, and the first seed of my vision to play for my country was planted in my brain and heart. When I witnessed Sanat Gurusinghe and Aravinda produce a devastating display of batting. That seed of ambition spurted into life when a couple of weeks later I watched that glorious final in Lahore. Everyone in Sri Lanka remembers where they were on the night of that final. The cheering of a nation was a sound no bomb or exploding shell could drown. Cricket became an integral and all important aspect of our national psyche. Our cricket embodied everything in our lives. Our laughter and tears, our hospitality, our generosity, our music, our food and drink. It was normalcy and hope and inspiration in a war-ravaged land. In it was our culture and heritage, enriched by a myriad ethnicities and religions. In it we were untouched, at least for a while, by petty politics and divisions. It is indeed a pity that life is not cricket. If it were, we would not have seen the festering wounds of an ignorant war. The emergence of cricket and the new role of cricket within Sri Lankan society also meant that the cricketers had bigger responsibilities than merely playing on the field. We needed to live positive lifestyles off the field and we needed to give back. The same people that applaud us every game need us to contribute positively back to their lives. We needed to inspire mostly now off the field. The tsunami was one such event. The death and destruction left in its wake was a blow our country could not afford. We were in New Zealand playing our first ODI. We had played badly, like at the Oval, and were sitting disappointed in the dressing room when, as usual, Sanat's phone started beeping. He read the SMS and told us a strange thing had just happened back home where waves from the sea had flooded some areas. Initially, we weren't too worried, thinking it was a freak tide. It was only when we were back in the hotel watching the news coverage that we realized the magnitude of the devastation. It was horrifying to watch footage of the waves sweeping through coastal towns and washing away in the blink of an eye the lives of thousands. We could not believe that it had happened. We called home to check. Is it true, we asked? How can the pictures be real, we thought? All we wanted to do was go back home to be with our families and stand together with our people. I remember landing in the airport on 31st December, a night when the whole of Colombo is normally lit up for festivities, a time of music and laughter and revelry. But the town was empty and dark, the mood depressed and silent with sorrow. While we were thinking how we could help, Murali was quick to provide the inspiration. Murali is a guy who has been pulled from all sides during his career, but he's always stood only alongside his teammates and countrymen. Without any hesitation, he was on the phone to his contacts, both local and foreign. And in a matter of days, along with the World Food Program, he had organized container loads of basic necessities of food, water, and clothing to be distributed to the affected areas and people. Amazingly, refusing to delegate the responsibility of distribution to the concerned authorities, he took it upon himself to accompany the convoys. It was my good fortune to be invited to join him. My wife and I, along with Mahela, Ruchira Pereira, our physio C.J. Clark and many other volunteers drove alongside the aid convoys 
towards an experience that changed me as a person. We based ourselves in Pulau Naro, just north of Dambulla, driving daily to visit tsunami-ravaged coastal towns like Trincomalee and Batiklo, as well as southern towns like Gaul and Hambantota on later visits. We visited shelter camps run by the Army and the LTTE, and even some administered in partnership between them, two bitter warring factions brought together to help people in a time of need. In each camp, we saw the effects of the tragedy written upon the faces of the young and old, vacant and empty eyes filled with sorrow and longing for homes, for loved ones, and for livelihoods lost to the terrible waves. Yet for us, their cricketers, they managed a smile. In the Kinya camp, just south of Trincomalee, the first response of the people who had lost so much <clears throat> was to ask us if our families were okay. <coughs> they had heard that Sanat and Upul Chandana's mothers were injured and they inquired about their health. They did not exaggerate their own plight, nor did they wallow in it. Their concern was equal for all those around them. This was true in all the camps we visited. Through their devastation, shone the Sri Lankan spirit of indomitable resilience, compassion, generosity, and hospitality, and gentleness. This is the same spirit in which we play our cricket. In this, our darkest hour, a country stood together in support and love for each other, united and strong. I experienced all this and vowed to myself that never would I be tempted to abuse the privilege that these very people had afforded me. The honor and responsibility of representing them on the field, playing a game they loved and adored. The role the cricketers played in their personal capacities for post-tsunami relief and rebuilding was worthy of the trust the people of a nation had in them. Murali again stands out. His Sinigama project with his manager Kushil Gunasekara, which I know the MCC has supported and still does with an ongoing funding of over 30,000 pounds a year, and which included the rebuilding of over 1,000 homes, was amazing. I was fortunate that during my life, I never experienced violence in Sri Lanka firsthand. There have been so many bomb explosions over the years but I was never in the wrong place at the wrong time. In Colombo, apart from these occasional bombs, life was relatively normal. People had the luxury of being physically detached from the war. Children went to school, people went to work, and I played my cricket. In other parts of the country, though, people were putting their lives in harm's way every day, either in the defense of their motherland or just trying to survive the geographical circumstances that made them inhabit a war zone. For them, avoiding bullets, shells, mines, and grenades was imperative for survival. This was an experience I could not relate to. I had great sympathy and compassion for them, but I had no real experience from which I could draw parallels. That was until we toured Pakistan in 2009. We set off to play two tests in Karachi and Lahore. The first test played on a feather bed, passed without great incident. The second test was also meandering along with us piling up a big first innings when we departed for the ground on day three. Having been asked to leave early, instead of waiting for the Pakistan bus, we were anticipating a hard day of toil for the bowlers. At the back of the bus, the fast bowlers were loud in their complaints. I remember Tilan Tushara being particularly vocal, complaining that his back was near breaking point, and he joked, and I kid you not, that he wished a bomb would go off so we could all leave Lahore and go back home. Not 30 seconds had passed <laughs> when we heard what sounded like firecrackers going off. Suddenly a shout came from the front, get down, they are shooting at the bus. The reaction was immediate. Everyone died for cover and took shelter on the aisle or behind the seats. With very little space, we were lying on top of each other. Then the bullets started to hit. 
It was like rain on a tin roof. The bus was at a standstill, an easy target for the gunmen. As bullets started bursting through the bus, all we could do was lay still, stay quiet, hoping and pr praying to avoid death or injury. <clears throat> Suddenly, Mahela, who sits right at the back of the bus, shouts, saying he thinks he has been hit in the shin. I'm lying next to Tilan. He groans in pain as a bullet hits him in the back of his thigh. I turn my head to look at him. I feel something whiz past my ear, and a bullet thuds into the side of the seat, the exact sp spot where my head was a second ago. I feel something hit my shoulder, and it goes numb. I know I had been hit. But I was just relieved and praying I was not going to be hit in the head. Taranga Pranavitan on his debut tour is also next to me. He stands up, bullets flying all around him, shouting, I just got hit. As he holds his blood-soaked chest, he collapses into his seat, apparently unconscious. Now this is his debut tour, and I see him. And I think, oh my God, you were out first ball, run out in the next innings, and now you have been shot. <laughs> what a terrible, terrible first tour. <laughs> it, is, it is strange how clear your thinking is. I did not see my life flash by. There was no insane panic. There was absolute clarity and awareness of what was happening at that moment. I heard the bus roar into life and start to move. Dilshan screaming at the driver, drive, drive, we speed up, swerve. And finally, we're inside the safety of the stadium. There is a rush to get off the bus. Taranga Parnamitana stands up, feels, the back, feels his back and says, oh, there's no hole there, I think I'm okay. <laughs> He's still bleeding. He has a bullet lodged lightly in his sternum. The body of the bus tempering its velocity enough <clears throat> to be stopped by the bone. Tilan is helped off the bus. In the dressing room, there's a, there's a mixture of emotions. There is anger, relief, joy. Players and coaching staff are being examined by paramedics. Tilan and Parnavitana are taken by ambulance to hospital. We all sit in the dressing room and talk. Talk about what happened. Within minutes, there is laughter and the jokes have started to flow. We have, for the first time, been a target of violence, and we had survived. We all realized that some of our fellow Sri Lankans, we, we all realized that what some of our Sri Lankans experienced every day for nearly 30 years had just happened to us. There was a new respect and awe for their courage and selflessness. It is notable how quickly we got over that attack. Although we were physically injured, mentally we held strong. A few hours after the attack, we were lifted to the Lahore Air Base, Air Force Base. <clears throat> Ajanta Mendes, <clears throat> his head swathed in bandages after multiple shrapnel wounds, suggests a game of poker. Tilan had been brought back sedated but fully conscious to be with us, and we make jokes at him, and he smiles back. We were shot. Grenades were thrown at us. <clears throat> We were injured, <coughs> and yet we were not cowed. We were not down and out. We are Sri Lankan, we thought to ourselves. And we are tough. And we will get through hardship, and we will overcome, because our spirit is strong. This is what the world saw in our interviews immediately after the attack. We were calm. We were collected and rational. Our emotions held true to our role as unofficial ambassadors. A week after arrival in Colombo from Pakistan, I was driving in Colombo, and I was stopped at a checkpoint. A soldier politely inquired as to my health after the attack. I said I was fine and added that what they as soldiers experienced every day we experienced only for a few minutes, but still managed to grab all the headlines. <clears throat>